Good morning. You can remain standing if you're able for the reading of God's word. And after we read portions of the scripture that Ryan's going to preach through, we will pray that the spirit will just illuminate our hearts um, and open up our minds to to the scripture. But we're also going to pray for a member of our congregation that is in the hospital right now. Today, most of the scripture comes from selections from 1 Samuel 18, 19, 20, and 23. And I'll read those cohesively. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine. And the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. And Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy and said to him, Go and carry them to the city. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, because we have sworn, both of us, in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and that it holds fast and true. We pray that you will illuminate our hearts and our minds to your word today. Um, that you will remove any sin that hinders us from hearing from you. Um, May we confess that and and even just repent and open our hearts to you today. And God, we pray um, for our brother in Christ, for Bill Douglas. Lord, we pray your hand of provision and protection over him. God, we pray that you will remove the pneumonia, that you will bring clarity to his mind, that you will heal his body. Um, God, we pray that you will give the doctors wisdom the nurse's kindness and joy and patience. Um, And we pray that you will overwhelm um, their family with peace, with comfort, God, that you'll provide a way for Rachel to be able to see Bill um, and just bring healing to his body and bring him home, um, back to his family. And we just pray all of these things in your good name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Hey, good morning. It's good to see you. It's good to be here with you celebrating Advent together. We, the, the kind of tact we've taken uh, to Advent this year, which is just a Latin word that means arrival. It's a great word that talks about the arrival of Christ, our Messiah, uh, on the earth and what he's come to do. And our series is called After Darkness Light. And we've been looking at kind of the big picture theme from Isaiah 9 um, that basically states that 
the people that dwelled in great and deep darkness have seen a great light that's overwhelmed us. And light is this metaphor, it's this picture um, of, of what Christ's arrival has um, accomplished for his people on this earth. And so what we've been looking at is really God's great uh, global plan for the world and to, to flood the world with light. Uh, we've looked at uh, what last week, what it would look like for a city to be flooded with light. Um, this week, we're going to be looking at really the, 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 the smallest kind of relationship, a friendship, what it looks like for a friendship to be flooded with light. And next week, uh, we'll be looking at the, the individual kind of level, what it looks like for a soul to be flooded uh, with light. The first time that I read this passage from 1 Samuel, um, specifically starting in chapter 18, I remember exactly where I was. Do you have any passages of Scripture that you've read that you remember exactly where you were when the Lord spoke that word to you? And it was this wild, I was 18 years old, sitting in my bedroom, supposed to be going to a basketball game with my friends, and I just got so enamored with God's word, so connected to the Lord that I just didn't even go to the game. I just sat there and I read God's word. I'm not that holy, so don't let your mind go there. But, um, but it was a good, it was, a, it was an amazing night. And you know, as I, as I look back on it and I recall what was happening, I think it was the first time in my life that I, that I realized this deep, unmet longing that existed within me for connection. Um, I think it was the first time in my life that I realized that, there was, that that was a good thing. It wasn't a bad thing. And that it was possible that God may be able to speak into that longing for connection, for friendship in my life. Some of you are in here today and you're in that place. You have this deep hole. You're lonely. You want to be connected and you wonder if God will ever meet that longing. And he'll never meet it fully on this earth. But he'll meet it through Christ. And he, he will, when we, when we pursue him, he will give us glimpses of that type of connection that he's made and designed us for on this earth. And, and I want to spend all of our time today really talking about that. Really looking at uh, God's kind of, the, the big picture of God's uh, design for us to be connected. Uh, really what it looks, what, what chemistry and a friendship looks like and really a pathway for us to experience that type of a friendship. Um, in Genesis chapter 2, you know, this is before sin enters the world, Genesis 3. We, we typically think about life uh, from Genesis 3 forward. We typically forget Genesis 1 and 2. But in Genesis chapter 2, we have this scene where God has created the world and he's even created Adam. He's created mankind. But then he looks at his perfect creation and as he's putting the finishing touches on his design, he takes note. And, and I think it's so interesting that he, that he gives Moses so much detail to write that down for us. And he draws Moses' attention to the fact uh, that there's a problem with his design. I mean, it's not sin, but there's, it's just not as complete. It's not as full as it could be. And he makes this utterance about, you know, looking at, at Adam there by himself. He says, you know, something's not good about this. It's not good for man to be alone. That's what he says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It's not good for man to be alone. Loneliness was a problem for God before it was a problem for us, church. And um, most of the time when we hear this passage from Genesis chapter 2, we immediately correlate it to marriage. Uh, and then we extrapolate marriage to primarily talk about God's design for procreation in the world. And then what it does is it completely isolates, you know, half of the world that's single, right? Marriage, before it was about procreation and intimacy, it was about friendship. Friendship is the antithesis to loneliness. And listen to this. Friendship will outlast marriage. There won't be marriage in heaven, but there will be friendship. And I, that's really good news for us today. Uh, because some of us even struggle in our marriages. Some of us are single in this room. But we all have this common denominator. We all long for connection. Some of us way more than others. You know, we're a little more extroverted. Others of us are a little more introverted, but we still long for this connection. This means, um, this means that, that there's nothing wrong with us when we desire that type of connection. So let me just, let me paint a picture for you, kind of a 50,000-foot view of friendship in the Bible. The first thing, or just four quick things that I want to state before we get into the nitty-gritty of this, is you were made for friendship. Genesis 2.18, it's not good for mankind to be alone. Your longing for companionship and friendship and connection to this world is pure and it's holy. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, 
In my life, I'll say this, deep connection with friends has been a deep longing that's often went unmet in my life. And God's given me seasons and glimpses of deep connection that I just treasure. And most of you in this room probably know what that's like. Um, the, the second thing that we notice is this, is that um, the story of the world is, 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 is this, that at some point, all of us must realize that we are lost by having the wrong friendships. Um, James 4.4 4 says this. He says, um, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That word enmity means enemy. So friendship with the world, connection to the world in a way that is, 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 is in the same nature as friendship means that we're enemies of God. Um, so in our longings for connection, uh, we have inevitably, all of us, settled for the world's way of connecting, which is based on living in the shadows and lies and not in the depth and honesty and transparency of a genuine friendship. Until we can honestly confess that we've all gone about friendships the wrong way, we'll probably never really have deep friends. We'll probably never be able to connect that deep because it'll be impossible for us to hit the depths that God has intended for our hearts to, to experience unless Christ leads us there first. And he gives us the safety and security to take risks to invest in people in that type of way. The third thing that we see just kind of in this kind of gospel of friendship, if you will, is that um, we are saved by the right friendship. John 15, uh, verses 13 and 15 say this, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So in other words, sacrifice is the ultimate uh, signal of friendship. And Jesus goes on to say this, and this is the night that he's going to be betrayed. No longer do I call you servants. And then he goes on to say that servant doesn't know what his master's doing. But he says, and he gives him the greatest term of endearment and connection. He says, I call you friends. Friends, if you belong to God through Christ, you are a friend of Jesus, which means you are a friend of God that he discloses his purposes and his heart and his intentions with us because that's what friends do. We know the plan and will of God to some degree because we have his word. The scriptures are the evidence every single day when you look at this Bible, this is the evidence of friendship right here. He's told us about himself. He's shared with us all we need to know to be saved by him, to be loved by him, and to experience him. And not, it doesn't stop at that, though, that this gospel of friendship goes on to empower us to a mission of friendship. We are empowered to befriend the lonely in this world. Because when the Lord befriends us through his grace, his compassion, and his mercy, despite our flaws and our shortcomings, he, what he does is he, in, in essence, reinstates our friendship with God, with our Father in heaven. And he sets us on this mission to seek out and search out the lonely and to befriend them with the friendship that we have with Jesus. John 17 says this. This is the high priestly prayer where Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he'll go to the cross. And he says this. The glory that you have given me, Father, I have given to them, his disciples, his friends, you and me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, so Jesus in us, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Church, friendship is a really big deal, and it's worth our time together today. Here's our big idea today as we dig into the story of David and Jonathan. Friendship is the ultimate expression of our relationship to God in eternity and the very present help that we need to process joy and sorrow in this world today. I know that's a mouthful, but I wanted you to see the design of God, the purpose of God, but also the very present help that we need uh, in and of our day-to-day -day life. So here we go. Let's dig into this. Let's look at this design of friendship uh, together. So as we think about this text from 1 Samuel 18, this, this passage comes on the heels of one of the most famous um, uh, passages of Scripture in the Bible, which is when David defeats Goliath. 
right? And so this is, it comes right on the heels of this, this great story. So the, the story of David and Goliath is this. There's this giant Philistine named Goliath who sits out in the middle of this valley every day. The Philistines are on one side, the Israelites on the other. And basically the, the way this thing's set up is, is that somebody's got to fight this Philistine. Uh, if they want, if they want to, to to kind of be able to, you know, pass go and 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 kind of move forward from this standoff, and so David goes out into the field with the intention of 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 seeing his older brothers and and checking in on them, and um, and David is this um, this young, I mean, pr- probably naive. Uh, uh, boy, who's but he's full of faith and full of God's spirit, and he goes out into this field and he sees right through this guy's soul. I mean, he just strips him down right there. He sees right through his threats. He sees right through um, everything that everyone else is afraid of. But it's not like in this worldly way. It's in this kind of spirit-driven way that he's seeing through him. And he basically says, "This, hey, I'll take him. I got him. I'll take him." And so Saul, who's the king at the time, the first king of Israel, Saul offers his armor uh, to, to David. He's like, hey, you know, let me at least give you something to go out there, help you out. And, and David says, you know, that's really not my speed. It's, it's, it, it fits clunky. It's too big. Not really what he had in mind. It's not really going to be this, this battle of, uh, of, a cra- you know, of, of, of a, a warrior's craft, which, you know, a technical fight. It's going to be God's way of doing things is what David's saying. And, and so David refuses it. And uh, the Lord empowers David, and David says this over and over again in in 1 Samuel 17, the Lord empowers David to slay this giant. And and the the known world is watching, especially Saul, and we're not told about Jonathan, but Jonathan definitely knows about what's going on. We're not sure where he's at. And that's where we pick up in our our story today about how this friendship is birthed between uh, David and Jonathan. So let me read the first four verses of 1 Samuel 18. If you've got a Bible, I'll welcome you to turn there as well. Here's what the scripture says. As soon as he, as soon as he had finished speaking with Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. <clears throat> and Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. In other words, David, who was kind of like the redheaded stepchild of the family, you know, living out in the field with the sheep, he says, no, 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 you're not going back to Jesse's house. You're staying here with me in my palace. So Jonathan starts, or David starts living there. And then Jonathan, verse two, or verse three, made a covenant with David. And this wasn't necessary. He didn't have to make covenant, didn't have to make this binding agreement to form a friendship, but he wants to. He makes this covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him, and he gave it to David. And his armor, and even his sword, and his bow, and his belt. This is a picture of how this friendship begins. It's a picture of what God is doing here between these two men. And what you see here is this really interesting day because in some ways it was the best day for David and the worst day for Jonathan, if you're thinking from a worldly perspective, right? Jonathan basically has just found out that he's not going to be the next king. So when he takes off his robe, when he gives him his belt and his, you know, it wasn't because, you know, David was asking for it, but he was in effect surrendering to God's will for their friendship. He didn't want his pursuit and his desire to be the next king of Israel to get in the way of the friendship. You you see what's happening here. There's this surrender that happens. And I just want to note a few things about God's design for friendship in this world. Uh, The the first thing is this, is that it's really modeled after the the, the character and the identity of who God is. Um, If you think about God, I mean, the very identity of God is best might be best described as friendship in and within Himself. I mean, think about this: three persons, one nature, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. We see we see this we see this friendship within the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and it's just mind boggling to try to get your head around this, isn't it? That that our connection with one another and our longing for one another is modeled after how God connects in and with of Himself. And and the the interesting thing about the Trinity, is that all three persons of the Godhead submit to and serve one another, and they display the true nature of who God is. 
You know, we don't have the fullness of who God is, and the church throughout history has gotten in trouble over this, right? We don't have the fullness of who God is if the Father, the Son, or the Spirit are missing. We just don't. And the, the interesting thing to me about how the Father and the Son and the Spirit relate to one another, uh, the most amazing feature is that all three of them are distinct, and they primarily relate to one another through serving one another. Do you hear the language of John 17 when Jesus is praying? The Father sends the Son out of love for the world. John 3.16 tells us that, right? The Son sends the Spirit to be an advocate and a helper for his image in the world. Remember, Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. John 14, I'm going to send the Spirit to be an advocate. I'm going to send the Spirit of sonship, of adoption into your heart so you will know that you belong to the Father and you belong to the Son. And the glory returns to the Father in heaven through the Spirit as he lives in the church. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are the model, the ultimate model of the friendship that you and I long for. The second thing about the, the design of friendship in the world is this, is that it's built for presence, okay? Because friendship is God's design. It's most meaning, it's, it, it, it's, it's experienced most meaningfully in this world when we experience it on God's terms, um, and I think spiritual friendships are so rare because they require a certain type of commitment. If you think about the, some of your friendships that have gone wrong, there have probably been wrong expectations, wrong types of commitments that have binded you together, bound you together. But the, the, the type of commitment that is required for a deep spiritual friendship is that we be present with one another at all costs. So you may have a friendship that is birthed out of some type of mutual commitment to something like work, something like a hobby, or even something like living in the same neighborhood together. And it's, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're friends. We hang out together because we were present together for a time. But the only friendships that last are friendships that really make no other demands than presence. And we see that with David and Jonathan's life. If you think about David's worst years of his life, they are bookended by his relationship with Jonathan. Jonathan literally, Jonathan literally keeps David alive in so many different ways. So if this is the commitment that's required, presence with other people, which really mirrors the Lord's friendship to us, because what does Jesus say before he gives us the grand mission of making disciples? Matthew 28, 20, it's the greatest verse in the Bible that no one remembers. He says, I'll be with you always to the end of the age. In other words, you're going to need my friendship through the Spirit to accomplish the mission that I've called you to. You're going to need my friendship. I'll be with you always to the end of the age. But you know why Jesus says that? Because he knows that we'll be lonely in our pursuit of connection in this world, that we'll feel isolated, and that we'll be embarrassed and ashamed because we really desire connection. And we, we try to find it in all the wrong places, and it leads to disappointment and despair, and we just want to throw in the towel. These types of friendships are so amazing because they offer the freedom to let others most fully become themselves as we become ourselves. You see, in my life, friendships that have veered off and have no longer stayed connected have been, have been they've been based on a certain season of life and a certain kind of uh, 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 scaffolding or structure that's been placed on it that tries to steer it into a certain direction. But the friendship of David and Jonathan is so amazing because they both get to fully become themselves. I mean, Jonathan, it, by the world standards, was he was supposed to be the next king, right? I mean, he was King Saul's son. But because the Spirit was driving this friendship, he was able to surrender that and say, no, 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 it's clear. You're the next king. Do you have the types of friendships where you're able to most fully become yourselves as you allow others to become themselves? Where there's that type of freedom in the friendship, um, bound within God's word, obviously. A friendship that commits to value presence doesn't place crippling demands and expectations on the relationship, but it simply commits to staying present with one another, which is probably the hardest thing of all to do, isn't it? Jonathan and David's souls were knit together. I mean, I don't know how you get a knit-together friendship. Maybe it's some kind of package you could pick up at Hobby Lobby. I don't know. But it's, it's, isn't it this interesting language, though, this 
soul knitting together. He doesn't say like, hey, they, they had some hobbies together and they, they love to connect. But he says their souls were knit together. And it was obviously expressed physically as they shared life and shared a full range of emotion together. But their souls were knit together. And David would time and time again draw on this promised covenantal relationship with Jonathan. And as I said earlier, David, literally, Jonathan's friendship to David saved his life by God's design. And likewise, David's friendship will end up impacting Jonathan's family for the rest of his life. When David enters into covenant, when Jonathan enters into covenant with David, you know, he, he, he's, he's, as I said a second ago, he's surrendering. And so what we see from what Jesus has said to us in John 15 is that Friendships that are, that are the type of connection that we, want, that we really desire, these spiritual connections, they require at least some form of sacrifice, some form of surrender under the Spirit's power. The, th- the third thing I'll say is this, is that um, the design of friendships is that they are robust enough to embrace adversity. And I'll just say this, you, you know, you, you don't really know how lonely you are until you experience adversity in life. You don't really know. You don't really know how lonely you are until, you know, things go terrible um, and, and, you, and, you, and you wonder who's left in your life, right? Um, you can fake it through a lot of experiences, but pain and suffering, whether you, it's self-inflicted or, you know, from an outside force, uh, draw us out. And there, I, I think there's kind of two maxims, you will, two, two kind of universal truths around this that we could say is, is, is the first thing is this, is that we cannot endure this world alone. Um, and, and as you think about the last two years of our lives collectively as, as a church and as individually, um, I, when, we, when we look at this, I, I think that there have been so many people that have been so depressed in the last two years, so many people. And it makes sense, like when you think about friendship. It makes sense why you would be depressed because we've been forced into isolation. We've been, we've been forced to be alone, and we were never meant to be alone. The second kind of maxim is we can't avoid pain and sorrow in this world. We just can't avoid it. So we weren't meant to be alone, and we can't avoid pain and sorrow. That leads to kind of this universal truth here from, from these two maxims. It's this, is that friendships were made to endure adversity. They were built for adversity. And... Um, we need companionship to endure sorrow in this world, some of which we will experience as a church today, this afternoon. And we also need it to celebrate and experience joy together because you weren't made to ex- experience joy and celebration alone either. It's a collective experience. There are all of these functions in society that try to replicate soul-level friendship and connection. None of them are sufficient, not one. Um, and that's social media. You know, if you, if you spend a lot of time on it, um, you know, maybe try going, going uh, uh, without it for a week and see what remains. These things can uh, support and express friendship, but they cannot create or cultivate friendship. They're not sufficient for that. They weren't built for that. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. So friendship comes alive at a new depth in times of adversity. It's the very thing we want to avoid. It's the very thing we want to hide. It's the very thing that we're ashamed to tell other people about, but it is the very thing that knits you together. Adversity, trial, suffering. The depth of friendship is tested and it's rated in adversity. We can't get through life alone and we can't avoid pain and sorrow. And so what does God give us? Friendship. When the light of the gospel shines through a friendship, church, it leaves the world in awe. And I would say this, our best apologetic, our best defense of the faith, our best explanation of the faith to a lost, dark, isolated, and lonely world is our friendships with one another. It's the very thing that we're most terrified of. And it's the one thing that cannot be manufactured or replicated artificially. Second thing, and I... I, I want, to, I want to dig into the second point is this, is that there is a certain chemistry to friendship. This isn't exhaustive, and I hesitate to even get prescriptive on this a little bit because I don't think ultimately that 1 Samuel 18 through 23 is a prescriptive passage. I think it's a descriptive passage. But as I was reading through the Proverbs this week, I started to see a lot of uh, uh, similarities into what the Proverbs were calling us to 
and what we were seeing in, in 1 Samuel. And so, so because of that, I feel the freedom to lean in. And also, I, I've noticed in preaching, a lot of times, uh, I'm more comfortable living in the ethereal, but what's really helpful for you is the practical, right? And so uh, uh, because of that, I want to I get a little practical here. I want to be helpful to you. I want you to walk out and be able to say, hey, here's a couple things I really need to focus on in my desire to connect with other people. And so... Um, and so let's dig into this. Really, I'm going to look at three kind of just characteristics uh, of, the, of, of, of pursuing a certain type of spiritual chemistry and friendship, okay? The first one is this, stickiness. Stickiness, all right? Um, there is a sticky factor to deep spiritual soul-level friendship. Um, if, you, if you think about this, this friendship with David and Jonathan begins at this amazing moment in David's life and this kind of really humbling and maybe terrible moment for Jonathan. Um, David's defeated the, the giant. You know, Jonathan's not the next king. I mean, talk about range of emotion, range of experience, range of life-altering situations that this friendship begins with. Um, that in and of itself was, is enough in our pride and in our flesh uh, and in our, uh, in our jealousy and envy to drive a, relation, drive a wedge in a, a friendship, right? That would be enough to just to kind of do it in right there. But covenant is different uh, than contract, right? Covenant is about a mutual presence and submission to one another under the power of God and under the sight of God together. And contract is about being a user, Right? How many of us treat our friendships like we do a rental car? Let's get real, right? What do you think I mean by that? When it serves us well, sure, we'll drive it. We'll be in relationship. But, but the moment that, that kind of my needs are met, I'm kind of bolting out of this. That's not a covenantal friendship. That is not a soul-level, knit-together friendship. It's a friendship that's based on uh, being a user, right? Right? Users are always, that's a bad thing. I mean, I mean, you have, we're all users of different services and things like that, and that's fine, and we can define those relationships to different, you, you know, wh whether it's a, a company or, a, uh, or, a, or a, a certain service that you have performed, um, but a covenant is so much different. There's a distinctiveness that's involved in that. Friendships, church, are about stickiness. They're about staying together, a certain stuckness in David and Jonathan's friendship. Listen, even several years later in 1 Samuel 20, uh, verse 42, listen to how this friendship is described. Jonathan said to David, go in peace, because we've sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you, between my offspring and your offspring forever. Now, this, this friendship, in the middle of these two chapters, there's been, you know, there's, there's been, uh, you, you know, uh, his best friend's dad tried to kill him a few times, right? I mean, that's kind of some adversity, right? But there's this, there's this maintaining, there's this stickiness that's involved in where these guys keep coming together. They keep prioritizing presence in their friendship. Proverb, uh, David's son, Solomon, it's interesting, right? David's son, Solomon, would, 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 would instruct us about this um, in the book of Proverbs, right? Solomon writes, writes this, and he writes this in uh, chapter 18, verse 24, about the stickiness that we see in his dad's friendship with his best friend. He says, a man of companions may come to ruin. In other words, a dude that's got a lot of Facebook friends, it might not be good for him, right? Uh, a, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, so sometimes you, you you may be asking you know so, so we're saying that that we should that, that we should expect to have deeper friends than we do in our uh, you know it, brothers and sisters in Christ than we do in our family I, I think yeah I think the scriptures say that uh, and I think that makes sense sometimes uh, you're gifted with a really close friend that is a relative of yours right but it's only if the spirit knits you together right. That's the only way that happens. And so sometimes we get so hurt because we, we long for the stickiness in our nuclear family, and we just don't get it because the Spirit doesn't give it to us. So what, what Solomon is writing is don't, don't fear that. Don't fear that. You can long for that. You can hope for that. But don't fear that when you don't get that because there are friends that stick closer than brothers. And it's this kind of spirit-knitting kind of friendship. So my question to you is we kind of take inventory here is kind of two sides. One is um, are you a sticky friend? Are you a sticky friend? Through thick and thin, is there a, is there a deep friendship maybe that, that maybe you've detached from for some reason? 
Um, maybe you look back and you say, yeah, we were close friends for a season, and it was kind of this deep soul-level friendship, but something happened. Is that something sin that drew a wedge that was unresolved and not dealt with? Do you think maybe the Lord would want you to pursue reconciliation with that friendship? Maybe it'll never be like it was, but it doesn't have to be like what it is right now. Are you a sticky friend? Do you trust the Spirit to keep you sticky, to, te- to keep you connected to others? Was that friendship, was, it, was, it, um, was division in that friendship, did it occur because of fear? Um, was it because of unresolved sin? Because I think the, the thing is, is we come into this idea of connection with so many expectations, but so little willingness to commit ourselves. We must be the types of friends that we long for, church. All right, second thing is this, uh, exposure. Gospel-shaped friendships let you in. In this story, we hear a lot about weakness. A friendship cannot be the type of friendship that you long for, that deep soul-level connection without exposure, without opening yourself up with the possibility and potential of getting hurt. And I'll say this, if you don't get hurt, I'll be surprised, all right? It's just going to happen, all right? It's just, you just got to know it's going to happen, but God's going to meet you even there, okay? Uh, exposure. Jonathan, if you think about this, could have turned on David. He could have done it. He could have said, you know what, man? You're just trying to take my dad's job. I see you. Um, or Saul at any time. He could have turned on Saul. He could have said, man, my dad's a terrible dude. Let's kill this guy, right? Um, he he could have done that. But, but they both stay out in the open with, with one, uh, their own safety, uh, their longings for connection, and also God's call for the kingdom, right? All of those things are out in the open. Have you ever been hurt by a friend who made a huge life decision and didn't talk to you about it? Shake your head because you have. In that moment, sit with me there for a minute. In that moment, what are you feeling? You're feeling like, man, I thought we really knew each other, right? I, I, I thought we were connected. I mean, and then, and then you start to doubt. You say, well, was all of that just a, was it smoke and mirrors before? I mean, what, what was happening, right? Or maybe, or maybe in that friendship, they, they, they lived the secret life and, and got found out. And you're like, what happened? I thought we were friends. I thought we were out in the open with one another. And maybe, maybe they didn't care what you thought. And it proved to kind of put the relationship in a different place than you thought it was. Or maybe they were afraid of what you thought. I've had this happen. You've had this happen. And it hurts. And it makes you wonder whether it's worth the risk at all. You know, Jonathan calls out his father. He calls him out. He says, why are you trying to kill David? You've benefited from what he's done. Your kingdom has expanded because he slayed the giant, right? He calls him out. But, but not only that, but he... He's also an advocate for David. He, he maintains this transparency, this openness with both relationships, and that's what friendships do. They don't try to manipulate and control the exposure uh, because that leads to really dark, deep, uh, hurtful things. But we trust the Spirit as we live in transparency. We might get hurt. We might be misunderstood, but we live out in the open. A friendship puts everything you can possibly put on the table. That's a deep spiritual friendship, right? Proverbs 18, you know, Solomon, David's son, will, will, he'll, he will reinforce what we see in 1 Samuel. In Proverbs 18, he says this, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. Okay, who's the one isolating in, in, uh, in 1 Samuel? It's Saul, isn't it? Saul's the one isolating. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. David was just a ploy in Saul's plan until he realized that David was going to take over, right? That that was God's plan. And then he gets defensive and he lashes out in anger and rage. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. In other words, all sound judgment says be vulnerable with your friends. Of course, you have to choose who to be vulnerable with and what to share. But if you're not living out in the open with at least a couple people, you're probably in sin. I think I can say that from the scriptures, right? Probably in sin, because we were designed to connect in all of life, church. There's nothing more hurtful or harmful in a friendship than avoiding exposure. And, uh, you know, maybe it's exposure for you. Maybe, maybe exposure means confessing your sin to one another so you can be healed, and you're just terrified of what's going to come from that. It's worth the risk, church. 
Maybe that's exposure of a decision because you're afraid that you're gonna hurt someone or you're afraid of what they might say to try to make you change your mind. But isolation, according to the word, is selfish and self-protecting. I, I was reading a book this week by this guy named Drew Hunter. It's called Made for Friendships, good book. And he says this, he says, friendship should be more like a submarine, holding few and going deep, but we've made it more like a cruise ship filled with lots of nice people whom we don't really know at all. That was a helpful image for me. Let's take inventory. Are there any areas in your life right now, in your friendships, where you are avoiding exposure? You are going out of your way to cover up your tracks. You are going out of your way to isolate. Are there any places for you? What would it look like for you to come into the light? Darkness loves to be by itself. The enemy loves to keep you in the darkness, to not be exposed. But the scriptures say that's a foolish, foolish endeavor that will lead you to a really dark place. The third thing in this point is this, is there's emotional fluidity in a friendship that's spirit level, has a spirit level depth. Um, it's interesting to feel this friendship with David and Jonathan, isn't it? There's no tough guy persona here. In fact, um, you know, we, we make movies about men being warriors. These guys are actually warriors. They've actually got swords, right? They've actually got robes. They've actually got the stuff. They're real warriors. And these guys are like as fluid as they can be with their emotions. I mean, they, that passage, what does it say? In 1 Samuel 20, 41, uh, the, the boy goes away after they make this little deal in the field, and they realize that really they're not going to see each other much anymore because of Saul. David rose from the stone heap, falls on his face to the ground, bows three times. In other words, he humbles himself as much as uh, possibly imaginable. And they kissed on one another and they wept with one another. And people make this, they make this joke, acting like these two guys uh, were in a homosexual relationship. That's, that's how lost we are when it comes to connection. These guys had this deep soul level connection that was emotionally fluid. Are your friendships emotionally fluid like this? Can they endure the, the, the moments where you got to be a warrior and the moments where you can't even hold yourself up? You're dependent on your brother to just hold you up while you weep. And this is David, the warrior king, weeping the most. In a friendship, we're designed to share the full range of our identity with one another, the full range of our emotional experience. And sometimes that's better, sometimes that's really bad, and it's hurtful. Um, but friends, make no mistake, feel together. That's God's design. In fact, Proverbs 27, 6 says this, um, sometimes your friends need to wound you. <laughs> Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. You got to read it like that, right? Um, do you have enough emotional fluidity in your friendships where you've let somebody into the, the degree where they can wound you. And when, I think when he says wounded here, it means they can speak the truth and love to you in such a way where you don't like it. Do you, or, or, do you, or do you just keep people on the kind of that cruise ship level where it's kind of like, oh, yeah, or sweet 202, you know, just down the hall? Or is, it, or, is it, or is it this emotionally, you know, fluid where you're able to speak the truth to such a degree that it feels like a wound, but you know it's actually helping you? Do you have that type of depth in your friendships, church? Because the Bible teaches that this is healthy and this is good. And if it doesn't exist in your friendships, you don't have the friendships that God's made you for. So this is kind of a lot of bad news, a lot of negative stuff, a lot of deep longings that we're connecting with. But how, what is the pathway to actually seeing this be present in our hearts and in our lives? I'll say this, this is, this is scary business because it takes risk to, take, uh, to live this way with other people. So what's the main thing? What, if we could boil it down, how do we get the strength the strength to be these kinds of friends to other people and have these kinds of friends in our lives. I think we have to refuse the opportunity to use people and to serve others. That has to be the mentality for us. And we, we see this uh, we see this in Jonathan and David's relationship. We see this with Jesus and his disciples and what the Spirit um, gives to us. When you think about Jonathan's, who Jonathan is, Jonathan's always a giver. He's never a user in the relationship. He could have betrayed his dad. He could have helped David uh, plot to kill his dad. Uh, David might have even went there. I don't know. You know, he was in a, he was in a weird place. Uh, but Jonathan stays present, loyal, and honoring to both parties. And Jonathan is so loyal that after he and 
David re-up their covenant in, 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 uh, in, in 1 Samuel 23, and they never see each other again. Jonathan is so loyal that he even goes with his dad into this foolish battle against the Philistines, and it ends up taking out their entire family. That's how loyal he is. You know why? Because friends serve and sacrifice. You are most filled up when you, get, when you give most away. That's what you find in friendship. Jonathan looks a lot like Jesus in this passage because he's not perfect, but Jonathan's dying for his friends. He's dying for his friends. He's dying for his father, dying to self for David. So how in the world do we get the power to live this way? John 15, 13, let me read it again for us. Greater love has no one than this. There's no deeper or greater connection, love, than this, that someone lay down his life, that he serve for his friends. No longer do I call you servants, Jesus says. He said, I have called you friends. If Jesus has called you friend, he's given you everything you need to be a friend through the Spirit. What is holding you back from serving others in such a way that you could call them deep, soul-level, knitted-together kind of friends? And not only that, and I'll close with this. I know I'm over on my time, but Genuine, deep, and covenantal friendship is felt by generations. It's felt by generations. It's not just what you feel. It's felt by generations. Let me read to you this passage about what happens with uh, David and Saul's family. It starts in 2 Samuel 4. I'm going to read some selections here. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel that they had died. And his nurse took him and fled, and as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth, which means from the mouth of shame. And David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? And the king said, because they'd made this promise, right, between my family and your family forever, and the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show kindness to, of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan, but hey, he's crippled in his feet. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, and he, he fell on his face, and he paid homage. And David said to Mephibosheth, and he answered, behold, I am your servant. And Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of, his, of the king's sons. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both of his feet. You know, there's so much emphasis on what's wrong with Mephibosheth in this passage, but so much joy comes into my heart when I read uh, David's response, what his friendship led him to. It's almost like, you know, in this passage that the, the author is trying to, to show us all the ways that Mephibosheth is unqualified for friendship with the king, right? And here's the thing. You might not be crippled in your feet, but there's a long list of things that you think in your own heart and your mind that might make you unqualified or unfit for friendship with the king. If we're honest about our own lives, we don't deserve friendship with God, not one bit. We don't deserve friendship with others, but because of God's grace, we get both, and it's beautiful. You and I are like Mephibosheth. We're crippled and we're carried to this table and we get to eat at the king's table all of the days of our life, church. The table is the ultimate expression of friendship, is it not? It's how we express our love and our care and our concern and our joy and our sorrow and our pain to one another. I don't know about you, but I want to experience the love of God through friends and I'm not afraid to say it anymore. And I pray that you won't be either because Jesus has called you friend. And that's made all the difference in our lives. Let's pray together. Father, I, I, I thank you for this friendship. This, it seems just idealistic to have a friend. For David to have a friend like Jonathan and Jonathan to have a friend like David. Yet your friendship with us is so much better. Lord, I pray today as we seek connection in this world that you would, um, you would lead our hearts to experience it in the way that you've designed uh, through setting aside our lives like Jesus did and serving others sacrificially, Lord. 
I pray that you would help us to be the kinds of friends that we long to have. And Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, if there's repair that needs to be happening, if there's repentance and reconciliation that needs to happen in between any connections in this church or with people in this church, outside of this church, God, would you give us the courage and the faith to trust you with it? Lord, especially as we think about the holiday season, Lord, even within uh, and of our own families, God, would you show us that the friendship that we have with you through Jesus Christ is deep and open and transparent and sticky and beautiful, and you long for us to get glimpses and taste of that friendship in this world. So, Lord, we thank you for the gospel that makes that possible. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan here. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us and watched one of our online sermons. Our vision as a church is to live as the family of God, together proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of grace to one another in our city. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church, we'd invite you to attend one of our in-person worship gatherings so you can experience all that God has for us as a community of believers on mission.